Actually, Moses was born in uh, January 1800, the son of Moses and Lucretia Beach. When Moses was four months old, unfortunately his mom died, and due to his father being out of town on business much of the time, he was opening up a colony pizza somewhere, I think. <laughs> he was brought up for the most part by his stepmother. As an only son on the farm, he was expected to do all the chores, do all the farm work, all by himself, which Moses didn't like that very much. When he was old enough, he moved to Hartford as an apprentice cabinet maker, then moved up to Northampton as a journeyman in his trade. In 1835, Moses moved to New York where he bought into the New York Sun, the newspaper for $5,200, which is a lot of money in 1835. The following year, he bought the rest of the paper for $19,500. Incredible, an incredible amount of money. After buying the paper, he found it was not profitable. He tried to sell it, but was unable to get his price <clears throat> or make any money. Faced with the not being able to sell with two year, within two years, he was able to turn the business around through determination, and he got out of debt, believe it or not. And he was also, Moses Y. Beach was also the pioneer of the penny press. In 1868, Moses died at the age of 69. He had the largest estate in Wallingford at that time. He had eight children. They were Drusilla, Moses, Joseph, Mary, William, Alfred, Henry, and Evelyn Beach. Obviously, we knew what his hobby was. <laughs> the school on North Main Street was named in his honor in 1950. That's the story of Moses Y. Beach. Next speaker, we'd like to introduce Dave Cunningham playing the part of William Smith. I am William Captain Tony Smith. I was born and emancipated in 1843 in North Brantford. As a young boy, I moved here to Wallingford. I made a living as a trapper along the Quinnipiac River and Community Lake. In 1861, the Civil War broke out. It wasn't until 1863 that the Union Army allowed African Americans to form their own ranks led by white officers. I was amongst the first volunteers to join the Massachusetts 54th Company F, the first African American regiment formed in the North. I fought in such battles as the assault on Fort Wagner on July 17, 1863. The battle was made famous by the 1989 movie Glory. I also fought in Alusty, Florida, February 1864. After the war, I returned home to Wallingford where I continued to trap. I married and had four children. During my service in the Army, I came to love the sound of the fife and drum. I formed my own band called the Dreadnoughts and marched in many community parades. I died in 1916 at the age of 78. My descendants living in New York have since started their own fife and drum band and marched here in town at the Jubilee celebration in June of 2000. Our next speaker is Jerry Farrell. He will tell us about the Reverend Samuel Whittlesey. Give Jerry a nice round of applause. Here. As the president of the Center Street Cemetery Association, I'm really happy to have all of you here tonight hearing about the history of the cemetery and how it connects with the town that we live in. Um, the particular person that I've been asked to speak about, Reverend Samuel Whittlesey, really is a unique figure that he has importance not only to our town, but also to our state and to our nation. He was born in 1676 in Old Saybrook. He was the reverend, the minister of the first congregational church here in town from 1711 until 1752. Beyond just religion and politics locally, he had an influence statewide and nationwide. And the reason for that was because of the religious battles that 
um, were waged during the first two centuries of the history of our country. That when those original English settlers came here to the United States, many of them had gone through the Protestant Reformation in England. They had gone through the period when Oliver Cromwell kicked the King of England off of his throne. And there was this period where there was no King of England. And Oliver Cromwell, as leader of this Protestant sect, uh, presided over the government of England. And those who came here uh, to New England and to New Haven in particular, those who founded New Haven in 1638 were part of that sect of people that we would nominally call Puritans. The reason that explaining about them is important is they form other communities and one of the communities that they form is Wallingford in 1670. Now those who believed in the Puritanism doctrines believed that there were a set of people called the elect who would get to heaven no matter what. That if you did good works, you lived a good life, it didn't overly mean a lot. You were predestined. You were on the list no matter what you did during your life. That's perhaps a bit of a simplification. But Whittlesey becomes sort of a pivotal figure in that debate that when he becomes the minister of the First Congregational Church in Wallingford, he enters this debate about predestination. He says, hold on, I think good works matter. I think that while the, the basic tenets of Puritanism are fine, we also have to say that what people do during their life should have an influence on whether or not they get to heaven. I don't know the answer to that question, but those are the debates that they were having during the early 18th century. And Whittlesey was one of those pivotal people who said, I don't believe what the orthodoxy says. And in those days, it was an orthodoxy. The people who ran the congregational church in this state, in this town, also ran the politics and the government of both the town and the state. Um, and Whittlesey becomes enormously well known for his association with the Reverend Timothy Cutler, who in 1717 says, good works matter. It almost gets Whittlesey kicked out of the Congregational Church. Timothy Cutler and others uh, leave the Congregational Church and head towards Episcopalianism, um, which did recognize good works. So Whittlesey is a pivotal figure in this debate going on throughout New England during those years of does good works matter? And that was so pivotal to the founding of this country that people came here because religion was important to them and they saw the United States, those 13 original colonies, as a haven for religious freedom and religious debate. He dies in 1752. Actually, his death creates another controversy, um, the so-called Dana controversy. So religious wars, I don't really want to call them wars, but religious debates continue in Wallingford uh, into the 18th and 19th century over these theological matters. And I think it's sort of unique to find people like Whittlesey here in our cemetery who we can point to and say, well, he, he was a pivotal person in the history of our country. And if you look throughout the cemetery, we do have other people who, um, like the Civil War soldier that we just spoke about, at one point or another, uh, just did unique things, and it's nice to have them here in our cemetery. If you do something unique, we want you to. <laughs> well, we'd be glad to have anyone, if you're a Wallingford resident, at the time of your death, talk to Bob. <laughs> but thank you all for coming this evening. Bravo!
Okay, we're at our next location. It's this small stone here, probably the smallest one we've seen so far. This is John Moss, and to tell us all about John is Bob Parisi. Give him a nice round of applause, please. The biggest guy gets the smallest stone. That's the way life is. My name is John Moss. I was born in 1604 in Wallingford, England. I had two sons, Mercy and John. I died in 1707, but I lived to the ripe old age of 103. I was a tough guy. John Moore, I was one of the original settlers of Walling. I was very active in the early years of the town. It's thought that I may have actually selected the name of Walling. And it's true, I think I did. <laughs> On the east side of town, there's a place known as Moss Rock. And I learned from this affair tonight, I always called it Morris, Morris Rock. But it's Moss Rock and it was named after me. It's located off of Woodhouse Avenue, near the town soccer and ball fields on a clear day, they say you can see New Haven Harbor from there, and I believe. Well, it's thanks very much, and thanks for stopping by. Okay, just follow our musicians again. If you could stay in the road, we're going down and taking a old small left. Are you ready? ready. To tell us about Mary Yale, Please welcome Kate Wall. Give her a nice round of applause. Good evening, everybody. It's so nice to see everyone out here tonight. And I want you to um, be aware when you listen to some of the speeches and what we tell about our history is the dates that are involved. Here in uh, Wallingford, of course, we were founded in 1670. But here in Connecticut alone, the fact that we have kept the records that we have, both in New Haven, Hartford, throughout the state, it's very unique, and it's unique to this country. We have the town records, we have the vital records. So we have a lot of history here, and I would welcome you to try to search out your ancestry or just to try to discover some of the records that we have here in our town. They're wonderful. Mary Yale was born in 1703. She was the daughter of Captain Thomas Yale and his wife Rebecca. Captain Thomas Yale came from New Haven. He was born in 16, I wasn't gonna look at my notes, 1647. He married his wife, Rebecca, in 1667 at the age of 20. He was one of the first settlers here in Wallingford. I was born, or Mary Yale was born, in 1684. She died at the age of 19 in 1703. Thomas Yale was um, not only one of the first settlers here in town, but also a surveyor, a justice <coughs> of the peace, and also the town moderator. And he died at the age of 89 in um, 1740, no, 1736. Okay, that's it. <laughs> We have another speaker. You don't have to move this time. I don't know if you're familiar with the TV show, and I'm sure you've watched it on Wednesday night, Wednesday Night Live, with John Sullivan and Ed McCarver. So yes, yes. <laughs> There's Tom who was on this week, Connecticut Street Rider. Well, this is Ed's wife. Uh, she needs more than applause. She probably needs ad. <laughs> Give Maureen McCarver a nice round of applause. She will be telling us all about Catherine Miles this evening. Catherine Miles was born in England around 1592. She came to New England as a young woman and she married Richard Miles. They had a son, uh, a major Thomas Miles, who had a daughter by the name of Anna. And Anna married the Reverend Samuel Street, who was buried here in the cemetery as well. Um, Catherine's husband, Richard, died in New Haven in 1663. Catherine died in January of 1687 
at the age of 95. And obviously tonight I'm here representing her. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that is Catherine Miles. Nice round of applause. of the McCarvers. We want to bring on Ed, who's going to tell us all about Abraham Doolittle. Give Ed a nice round of applause. Please. In my private life, I am Mr. Maureen McCarver. <laughs> but tonight, I am Abraham Doolittle. I was born in 1620 in England. I had 11 children. Like Moses Y. Beach, I had no hobbies. <laughs> My children are Abraham, Elizabeth, Mary, John, Samuel, Joseph, Abigail, Ebenezer, go, hey. <laughs> Mary too, Daniel, and Theophilus Doolittle. In New Haven, 1644, I took the free man's oath. I was made sheriff of the county of New Haven. In 1670, I was one of the first to settle in Wallingford. I died August 11, 1690, at the age of 70. I, Abraham Doolittle, was the first Doolittle in the New World. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will tell us all about Elijah Hall. We're looking for Richard Swarda. Oh, wow. Here he is. Please give him a nice round of applause. Good evening to you all. For sake of arguments, let's assume tonight it is 1780. And I'm coming to you from the camps of the Highlands off the Hudson River in New York. I portray Captain Claghorn, and I know of Elijah Hall from this town and have decided to come to speak to this august gathering this evening. Private Hall, as a young man, joined the 6th Connecticut on May 19, 1777. And what an auspicious date that was for him and for us as well. He had his choice to join for three years or the duration of the war or his death, whichever came first, he opted to join for the duration of the war. On May 19th, the 6th Connecticut set out from New Haven on a raid to Long Island Sound, to Sag Harbor. You may not be aware of Sag Harbor. It's a very important British shipping port. It takes lots of supplies, rum, hay, guns, and munitions there to be distributed among the North American uh, colonies by the British Empire. The British had been suffering the Connecticut coast with depredations earlier in that year, 1777, having burned Norwalk and Fairfield. And it was decided that perhaps we needed to do a revenge raid. Well, don't you know, Elijah Hall joined the regiment the day we moved out. Lucky for him and lucky for us. He got to come with us. We moved out of New Haven, went down to Gilbert at Sachem's Head. We, we stayed there for two days and waited a storm to blow over. We then got into about a dozen whale boats and a couple of small skiffs and rowed our way across Long Island Sound to the North Fork of Long Island, where Private Hall, among others, was forced to lift the boats up out of the water and carry them across the North Fork of Long Island, a distance of only about 200 yards and put them back into the bay where we could then proceed on down towards Sag Harbor. We camped that night in the woods, and the following day we moved on down to Long Beach. And that night, we raided the village of Sag Harbor on Long Island. And I can tell you that it was a very successful raid. We burned 13 ships to the water line that were at the docks. We destroyed hay and rum stores. We captured, first of all, the outlying guards, we then marched into the settlement, into the middle of the village, and captured the entire British officer corps who were lodged in the building, the local tavern and hotel. They were rudely awakened at about two o'clock in the morning to find that they were surrounded by us, Private Hall being one of those among us. 
We then did a firefight with the British regiment up on the hill and captured the entire regiment. We did all of this without losing a man. We gathered up our prisoners, marched back to three miles to Long Beach, got in the long boats. We rowed the long boats back to the North Port, where we were very pleased this time to have our prisoners pick up the boats out of the water <laughs> and carry them across into the south. And then we rowed our way back to New Haven. The prisoners were disposed of and put into prison camps here in uh, northern Connecticut and in eastern New York. It now being 1780, we have already also had the battle at Stony Point, another battle in which Elijah Hall was involved, a midnight bayonet attack with unloaded muskets on a fortified British position, Stony Point on the Hudson River in New York. I'm pleased to say as well that that attack was carried with success by American forces. I wish that Private Hall could be here with me to address his townsmen, but however, he's still on duty in the town of Highland on the Hudson River of New York. Thank you so much. You have given us a fine man to service his country. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dave Holloway. He will tell us about Reverend Samuel Street. Give Dave a nice round of applause. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the Reverend Samuel Street. I was born in New Haven in 1635. I graduated from the College of Yale in 1664. I married Anna Niles in 1664, November of that year, and in 1669, we were discussing coming to Wallingford, but a man of my education and stature in the community, I felt that I should be, have suitable housing and get paid. So in 1673, the town of Wallingford taxed the people for my pay of 50 pounds a year, which is equal to now $150. But, they taxed the town people and they built me a house. My house is still standing on South Main Street. Right now it's gray. I went by today to make sure I knew the color. And it used to be by the church, the top of the hill, but I think it was in the late, early 1800s, they moved it down South Main Street. While I was waiting to come to Wallingford, I taught at Hopkins Grammar School where I taught uh, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And after moving to Wallingford, I married uh, an Anna Nile Miles out of New Haven, and we had seven children. Now, when you came to church in that time, church was all day. You came at seven or eight o'clock in the morning, you left at 4.30 in the afternoon. You brought a lunch. My opening prayer took an hour. Then we would have a break, and then I would have the sermon, which was two and a half to three hours. I tried not to go over three hours. <laughs> and then we would have lunch. And then we would come back for prayer and a, another smaller sermon, and then you would be dismissed for the day. Now, it also included, Wallingford at that time included Meriden and Cheshire. And they didn't separate until the 1800s. Now, I was a pastor at the church for 45 years. I died at the age of 82 in 1717, and my wife Anna died at the age of 91 in 1730. Thank you. Our next speaker to tell us about William Holt is Jim Vombaco. My name is William Holt. Unfortunately, there's not a lot that's known about my background, and this evening I'm going to intend to keep it that way. <laughs> I'm one of the oldest people of this group of individuals that you have seen this evening. I was born in 1600 in England. I died in Wallingford September 1st, 1683. 
at the ripe young age of 83. My field stone marker, which is back here, number three, is the eldest tombstone in the Center Street Cemetery. It should be noted that I was not the first person to die in the town of Wallingford, and that my name was originally spelled Holt, H-O-U-L-T, which is the first of its kind in the New World. Thank you. Bill Paquette is up next to tell us about Dr. John Hull. Give Bill a nice round of applause. I um, am Dr. John Holt. I was the first physician in Wallingford. And I have to tell you, I don't know when I was born. Google wouldn't give it up. I can tell you when I died, 1711. But that's not the whole story. You see, I came to Stratford in 1661, and I was a very, very prosperous farmer. I was so good that Derby noticed that and offered me a land grant seven years later. I moved to Derby, where I was a successful builder, and I was a, a successful businessman. And then Wallingford, 12 years in Derby, Wallingford noticed me. They said they needed a, a, a physician. And I had never practiced medicine, but at that time, I was a farmer, a builder, and everything else, but not a doctor. I was certified, though, Yale Med School. And uh, Wallingford attracted me, put 700 acres here in Wallingford, which would be worth a nice penny at this time. I was married three times, once in Stratford, once here in Wallingford. I had nine children. I have one young lady, and I have to read my son's name. Easy to remember the girl that was married. The eight boys were John, Samuel, Mary, Joseph, Benjamin, Richard, Ebenezer, Jamarian, and Andrew. I married a third time after my second wife's death. And at that time, uh, because of my title of doctor, <coughs> Wallingford recognized me as a doctor and they called me Dr. Hall. And Dr. Hall is on my beautiful, Mary, could you point to where I am back there? Because I'd like to have you be able to see me. That is my stone right there. Now I have another interesting story to tell you that one of my direct descendants, um, Captain Isaac Hell, Hell, I'm sorry, Dr. Isaac Hull was the master of the USS Constitution in the War of 1812. And that master's ship took the first uh, prisoner ship from the Royal Navy. And that was a very big thing for our family to have that happen. And I must say to you that the USS Constitution is still commissioned in the United States Navy it is available for you to view at the Boston Naval Yard. So the Hulls made a great contribution to Wallingford, and I'm glad I could be here tonight. OK, our final speaker, we're getting close to first pitch time. <laughs> our final speaker probably to tell us about one of the most, or if not the most famous person to ever live in Wallingford, Lyman Hall. It's our mayor. William Dickinson, the Honorable Mayor of Wallingford. Thank you. It is a delight to be with you this evening. And I'm going to talk about our lives because in large measure, I think my life perhaps mirrors many of your issues and concerns. I was born April 12, 1724 on South Elm Street. There were good times. I was able to attend Yale College, now university, and graduated at the age of 23. At that time, I wasn't sure what I should do, and I went into the ministry. But I was only in the ministry for two or three years as a congregational minister, and decided that treating souls was perhaps not my direction. Perhaps I should try to treat bodies. So I became a physician, and actually started a practice here in Wallingford. During the course of my being a physician, I continued to be interested in matters of theology and joined with a Puritan group. Now the Puritans, as you know, went to Massachusetts, but they were always on the move. And I was always on the move. With that Puritan group, I went to South Carolina and was there perhaps about a year. From there, that same group, or elements of it, went to Georgia. 
I went to Georgia and purchased a rice plantation in the Midway District in Georgia. I purchased two lots in Sunbury, Georgia, right on the coast, for a home. <coughs> At the end of the French and Indian War, 1756-57, things began to really change in the colonies. Great uncertainty, great turbulence. <coughs> England wanted to make changes, wanted to pay for the cost of the French and Indian War, and they turned to the colonies to cover those costs. The governor of Georgia at the time was appointed by the Crown. Didn't want to hear anything about any revolts or rebellions or upsets <coughs> over the direction of England. There were people in Georgia who felt differently. I was one of those people. And having come from Wallingford, from New England, had perhaps a very different view of the worth of the individual and the importance of freedom. <coughs> so I became one of those who urged Georgia to reject royal rule. It was a long and turbulent process. Georgians in general were not interested in starting something in the way of a fight. In 1774, when there was great, great uncertainty, hostility in New England, Georgians were not willing to get involved. I and a few others were able to gather 579 barrels of rice to send to aid the patriots in the Boston area. No different than we look to send relief today. In 1774 was the first Continental Congress. Georgia sent no representatives, though I and a few others lobbied strongly for Georgia to send representatives. It did not happen. In 1775, I went to the Second Continental Congress, but I did not represent Georgia. Initially, I represented the St. John's Parish. I felt that strongly that even though I was representing one parish, I responded to the need of the colonies overall. Very difficult times, and it was not until the rice boat war, in which the British tried to see, seize some rice boats right off the coast of Georgia, that Georgians generally became inflamed. And ultimately, as you know, I was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. As you can see, my life perhaps is not that different from yours today. We're faced with many of the same issues, and the bright flame of freedom requires us to sacrifice and act on principle. I thank you for listening to me, and now I believe we are to join in the national anthem. <laughs>
round of applause. Let's get everybody back up here. Dave Cunningham, Jerry Farrell. Hold on a sec. Change of plans. <laughs> Captain. <laughs> Hey folks, before we, we conclude this, this night, I want to thank all of you for being here, number one. Then I want to go down the list. I'm not going to bring everybody up here, they're going to be tripping all over all the bushes here. Let's start with Mike Stevens. What was he been here for? David Cunningham, who's come a long way. Maureen McCarver. When I say these people answer the call, they answer the call. Jerry Farrell. <laughs> John Moss, of course, with Bob Parisi. Kate Wall comes down anytime I ask her. Jerry Yale. Richard Swarthout. Richard Swartow and Dave Holloway are both part of the 6th Connecticut, and David Holloway is also a member of the 2nd Company of the Governor's Guard. Richard Swartow is the Rifle Hall. David Holloway is Samuel Street. Our Town Council Chairman, Jim Bobacco, is William Holt. My old buddy from Lyman Hall, Bill Paquette. Out our mayor as Lyman Hall, Bill Dickinson. <laughs> One last note, Center Street Cemetery obviously has been around for many, many years. One woman who has been part of our board for, let's just say 20 years, that'll make her happy, is Jean Holloway. <laughs> Stay on the roads walking out of here, please. Go safely. Come back next year. Enjoy the taste of Wallingford. Good night. Good night. Good night.